Okay, good morning everyone. Uh, welcome to another sunny Wednesday morning and this morning we are with Ryland Ash who will be talking to us about procurement and tendering. Um, as always this is being recorded so this will be available for you, for you from tomorrow. Uh, hopefully you've all downloaded the materials. The link was in your joining instruction email. Um, not a lot else to say today uh, other than to hand over to Ryland to let him start. Uh, oh, just sorry, just one quick thing. If you've got any questions, we will be answering those at the end. But this is a new style where we've upgraded our system. So you'll notice on your bottom toolbar, Q&A. If you click on that, you can answer any questions you want on there. And you can see all the other questions that have been asked. Um, and then we will get to these at the end and, and Ryla will answer as many as possible. So again, without further ado, definitely this time, Ryla, I'm handing over to you. Lovely, thank you very much, Julie. And a very warm welcome to everybody. Thank you for joining us uh, on this lovely sunny day. Um, I'm hoping to make the subject of procurement and tendering um, a slightly more sunny subject for you to consider this morning. Um, so that the challenge is certainly with me. Um, today's seminar, I'm going to cover the history really of the progress of the law surrounding contract formation. Um, how the procurement process works in different um, organizations. Um, and then um, we'll take questions at the end in relation to any issues um, that you're facing in the industry. And I'm gonna give some pointers in relation to things we should be considering in relation um, to the challenges that we face with regard to coronavirus. <clears throat> So my background is as a uh, barrister originally. Um, I qualified many years ago um, and shortly after qualifying, I went to Southeast Asia and worked on a turnkey project out there, uh, which involved some design, build and operation uh, projects in Taiwan. Um, when I moved back to the UK, I started dealing with disputes, contract, uh, placement, procurement, tendering, disputes, um, and also um, contract drafting and advice generally. So my experience is very broad, particularly in relation to projects and the placement of different types of contracts on um, projects, not only in the UK, but also internationally. <clears throat> so this slide really sets out um, the basic agenda for today. We're going to start by looking at how you form a contract. Um, and what would be sufficient in the eyes of the law um, to create a legally binding relationship. Um, and I'll also talk about what happens where there is no binding relationship, which is something that happens fairly commonly um, uh, and is surprising often to parties. Um, there's some very interesting case law over the last few years uh, on that subject, which I'll come to. Offer and acceptance um, are the key principles of contract formation, um, but we'll talk about rejection, counteroffer, and acceptance and how that can come about. But before we go into the legal principles, I think it's important to just set out the general uh, basics in terms of procurement. So with procurement and tendering, um, the idea is that there is a process which is clear from the outset, but sometimes not. Um, as to how a new project, uh, which has either been designed or not yet designed, can be established by way of an agreement between a professional team and eventually the building team. And sometimes it can go further and relate to how a project is funded and then further still how it's operated and potentially then sold, passed on um, or handed back to a client over a period. So it's all about the construction process and how it fits together. In short, there are a handful of basic procurement processes. First of all, you have what's known as the traditional approach to procurement. Now, the traditional approach um, is something that starts with a design concept um, and it will have uh, a client or a stakeholder who has an idea they will engage an architect or a designer who will then produce that design, develop that design um, to a point where it can be built 
um, and then there'll be a separate distinct contract with a contractor or a series of contractors um, to build and realize that design. So that's the traditional approach where there's a separation between the design process and the building process. Now, the downside to that is that clients won't have one point of contact, they'll, they'll have several, so they need more management and support through those processes. Um, and also, there can be um, a little bit of sort of muddying the water between well, what issues relate to design, what, what relate to construction. Um, and so um, there's more work in, in managing that. But there is a lot of freedom um, and there's certainly a bit more um, clarity uh, often uh, in relation to what's being built and what the intention is. What the downside, of course, uh, well of that is, is that it's less flexible. Um, once the design is fixed and a, co a contract's entered into, then any changes are obviously changes to the contract which have a, a monetary value. The next um, avenue for procurement is a, is a single stage design and build. And you can also have a two stage design and build. Um, design and build is where both um, obligations for design and construction uh, lie with one party. So you can see the obvious benefit of having um, only one uh, point of contact for a client. So clients tend to prefer this, um, although it is generally uh, considered to be more expensive as a procurement route. Um, and what tends to happen is that sometimes you'll have an architect that produces a design and then that contract with the architect is novated across to a contractor who then becomes responsible for that design and the build. Or you can have a process whereby the contractor does everything. And normally contractors will have um, a team of, if they're doing design and build, a team of consultants or designers who will produce the designs um, just in the same way that a client would go to an architect, they go to the contractor though. They approve that design um, and then it can be developed over time as the construction takes place. Um, so th there's good um, opportunities there for integration of the design and the construction process, for money saving, um, and obviously for changes in relation to that design as well. And the third category is, is a management um, construction process where you will have um, a designer and then what you'll, you'll do is once the design is, is set, if you like, um, you'll then engage a management contractor who will then engage a series of trade contractors underneath um, that umbrella. And what that does, again, the, the idea is to take away some of the pressure um, of managing um, the project from the client, It's really a handover to the management contractor, and then the management contractor will deal with each individual trade contractor. Now, the downside to that is that there's an extra layer of administration, which means an extra layer of cost in relation to the management contractor. Uh, but again, there's good flexibility there in relation to changes. Um, and then finally, we have projects where there's a turnkey process. So either the acquisition of land or funding as, a, as an initial step, um, and then perhaps a development of an idea by a developer, a contractor, and then um, a public finance initiative, uh, private finance initiative projects, uh, PFI projects as well. So where there's a funding and operational element, um, that, that's a different distinct process for procurement. So they are broadly um, the, the different approaches to procurement. Um, now let's look at um, how contracts come about under each of those um, processes and how the courts view um, whether or not there is a contract between parties. So the starting point in English law is that you need to have, um, in order to have a binding contract, you need to have an offer, you need to have an intention to create legally binding relations, and you need to have consideration, which is something of value. Um, it doesn't have to be a price. It could be something, uh, a benefit or burden passing between the parties. And then you need to have acceptance of that offer. Now, the short point here um, is that quite often at the early stages of procurement, where there is um, an element of negotiation, and there isn't always, it's important to note that uh, for example, some government processes, um, local council processes are closed to negotiation. Um, they're restricted as they're known. <clears throat> so in that sense, there may not be a negotiation. But 
where there are in, in the majority of cases, um, the negotiation between the invitation to tender, the tender being submitted, um, an offer being made, um, perhaps an acknowledgement of an offer, an order being um, issued, and then acknowledgement of that order, um, and then even potentially the issue of invoices and terms and conditions. All of these things come into the mix early on. And this is where quite often contract formation will fall down or will, the problems will be created. And I'll give you some examples as we run through the case law um, of how these are resolved. But the first point to make uh, is an important one about um, the counter offer. So if somebody places an offer on the table, such as in the case of Hyde versus Wrench back in the 19th century, in that case, um, there was a farm for sale. It was advertised for a price. So it was an invitation to tender now, or, or to make an offer. Now, an invitation is not something that can be accepted. An invitation um, is, 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 is as it stands, an invitation for somebody else to make an offer to you. So you can't create a legally binding contract on the back of an invitation only. So there was an invitation to buy a farm for, let's say, a £1,000. Uh, farm for sale. So uh, a chap turns up, um, Hyde turns up to Wrench's farm and says, um, I'm interested in buying your farm. The farm was advertised for a thousand pounds and he says, I'll, I'll give you 900 pounds. And um, uh, Wrench says, well, no, thank you. I think my farm is worth more than that. Um, and so he goes away and says, good day. And then, um, uh, and leaves him to it. Anyway, he comes back a number of weeks later and says, I've been thinking about it, and I will pay the original price for the farm. And so we now have a deal because I've accepted your offer. Well, the owner of the farm said, well, no, the uh, price of the farm has now gone up. You offered me 900 and that wasn't acceptable. It's now 1200. And so they fell out. Um, they had a dispute and they went to court. And what the court said, um, and this is still good law today, as soon as you make a counter offer, so you try and change any part of somebody's offer to you in response to it, what that does is it displaces the previous offer and it effectively becomes a new offer to the party that made an offer to you. And then it's for them to consider whether they accept that counter offer. Now, of course, in construction, this means quite often that where there is a counter offer that doesn't refer to specific terms and conditions, those terms and conditions will be lost in the ether. Um, they will fall away and they will no longer be relevant to the parties. So when you're restating uh, counter offers um, or making counter offers, it's very, very important. It's, it's a crucial importance that you make reference to the particular terms and conditions that you want to apply to your agreement. Otherwise, they're not likely to be relevant at all. So the next thing to consider, um, once we understand what the, um, the last offer was, it is what's known as the battle of the forms. It's which terms and conditions will apply. Well, the invitation to tender referred to a certain set of terms. But then the, the offer that was made, the tender that was submitted, had terms and conditions attached to it. Then you had an, or, an order placed, um, but that order refers to a different set of terms and conditions, um, and so on and so forth. And you can see how the confusion comes in. In English law, the, 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 the rule is that the person who makes the last shot, fires the last shot before acceptance, um, wins the battle of the forms. So it's the person who gets in at the last minute, just before acceptance occurs, um, and provides um, a, a, an offer um, and sets down the terms of the agreement. So where there's a series of offers and counter offers, the last offer uh, will be the one that stands. And the courts have examined this many, many times over the years, but the key case is uh, Chichester Joinery, which is on your slides there from 1987. And in that case, um, as I described earlier, in fact, um, there was a number of exchanges between the parties. Um, and if you look at the next slide, it sets out um, the history to this case. 
So there was a, a quotation submitted in November 84 based upon terms and conditions. There was then a pro forma inquiry form which referred to terms and conditions on its reverse. Parties then discussed a proposed contract at two meetings. Then there was a purchase order. Um, and then finally, uh, there was an acknowledgement of that order sent. Now, when this got to court, the court said that this is a classic case um, of where this could have all been avoided because the parties should have really agreed what they intended um, to do prior to the works commencing. But in short, what the courts decided was that that last shot, the acceptance um, was created in respect of the acknowledgement. So the acknowledgement of order, if, if anybody um, listening to this seminar um, has a process in their business whereby there is an acknowledgement of orders, be careful because that acknowledgement of an order is likely to be considered the last shot. And of course, if that has different terms and conditions than were previously discussed or even written, then that will take priority. Um, and that's a good example of the last shot that was fired being the one that stands. <clears throat> and it's important to know also that in that case, the acceptance of the uh, acknowledgement uh, of the order was simply by accepting that the works could progress, that um, materials could be delivered uh, and the work started on site. And that was enough. The next issue uh, I'd like to cover is, is a situation where a tender contains errors. Um, and um, if those errors are within the knowledge of the other party, um, can the tenderer who submitted that erroneous um, tender uh, have any recourse? Now, it's generally the view um, that a party is bound by the terms that, it, that they agree, um, even if they make a bad bargain. Um, I'm afraid you're stuck with a bad bargain so long as you were aware of it. Um, but this case is a little different because in this case, um, it was in fact decided that the error in the documents was so obvious that um, the director who was reviewing them um, if he were acting reasonably, um, would have known uh, that this was an error and therefore it was considered a unilateral error which could be rectified. And in this case, the courts decided that it was fair and reasonable um, to allow the contractor um, to amend their contract. Uh, and in this case, um, it was a mistake by missing out some cladding work um, in the tender price, which was effectively half of the contract sum and that, that amount was added back into the contract uh, and the contractor had some relief. But it's important to distinguish this case from a case where perhaps um, there isn't an obvious mistake in the bills. Um, and if there's no obvious, obvious mistake, um, then probably the reverse applies and the contractor will be stuck with any remedies uh, that they had under the contract. So what if a contractor submits a tender with his own conditions attached, which were neither accepted or rejected? Do these conditions apply? Um, now we can go right back to 1862 um, to Felthouse uh, and Binley on this. Um, this is uh, a case really that established um, what is a fairly well-known principle that silence is never acceptance. Um, and the facts of this case, although weren't squarely in relation to silence, they were actually more about whether or not um, the parties had conducted themselves in a way that was consistent um, with the terms and conditions that had been put forward. But in short, the court said, well, um, unless there is a very clear acceptance um, of those terms, either by conduct uh, verbally or in writing, um, then those terms will not be held binding. Um, and this was in relation to the purchase of a horse by um, uh, a gentleman from his uncle 
Um, and he effectively said, um, I'd like to buy your horse unless I agree otherwise uh, from you by next Friday, uh, I'll deem to have bought your horse from you. Um, and the uncle never uh, responded. The horse was actually sold by accident. And the question was whether or not he had good title. That is the nephew had good title to the horse. Um, and perhaps unsurprisingly, the court said, sorry, uh, you're going to need more than um, just silence. So, but I think there's buried in there an important point. Often um, clients will come to me and say, well, uh, I've written to the other party saying, unless I hear from you by X date, then I'll deem that you have accepted my position. Well, I'm afraid in law that's not recognized. Um, the next interesting case I'd like to refer you to is RTS Flexible Systems and Molkeri. Um, this was a very complicated case in terms of the factual background. But there's an example in here of the perils of proceeding with work under a letter of intent. And there are many, many cases in relation to letters of intent. Um, but in particular, um, in this case, um, essentially, the test that the courts decided was that um, if a reasonable and honest company director believed that an agreement was being made, then that agreement will be binding. Um, but it very much depends on the factual background of the case. Um, and there's an interesting point in this case as well, that the initial documents um, stated that they were subject to contract. And you may have seen documents that say subject to contract. Well, subject to contract following this case um, was found to be not so powerful in the sense that it could be overridden by the party's conduct after the document is issued. So up until this point, it was almost invariably felt that if you said subject to contract, then nothing within that offer could be binding. But what is clear is that over the years, the party's um, conduct uh, has become more relevant to the courts. The courts are now looking at situations uh, more carefully and they're saying, well, if the parties, like in this case, acted in a way that was consistent with an agreement being made, then clearly there must have been some kind of expectation that there was an agreement. And act in accordance with terms and conditions uh, on that background was sufficient uh, for the court to find that there was uh, in fact, a binding contract. And it was very much about the state of mind um, in the, uh, the director's uh, minds and also what the evidence could demonstrate the parties were intending to do at any given time. Uh, but that case sums up quite neatly um, at the end, towards the end of the judgment. Um, it says how important it is to make sure that parties have a written agreement and it may sound obvious um, that you know you shouldn't proceed with works until you have the contractual position bottomed out but the reality is in far too many cases that i'm aware of um, the parties do end up doing this um, either because of the speed that's required to commence or the complexity of the contract documents um, but the reality is what you should be trying to achieve um, is if you can't agree everything from the outset, is to agree things in stages. Make sure you have an, a, a clear agreement from the outset up to a certain point. And then subsequent to that, obviously, if you can agree further terms, then you ought to be doing that. Um, the worst case really um, is where you ultimately do not come to any formal agreement. Um, now, if, if there is uncertainty um, about the terms, and the courts have also said there should be a reasonable degree of certainty about which terms apply. If that's just simply not there, um, or if um, an offer clearly states it's subject to contract and no formal contract will ever be um, created between us unless or until something is signed, then ultimately, I think the sort of worst case there is that there is no contract. Now, if there is no contract, um, then you get into a whole quagmire of different arguments. The argument will effectively be that you are entitled to what's called a quantum merit, which is a reasonable sum of money. 
Now, a reasonable sum of money to a contractor or subcontractor may actually represent a better deal than having a contract. Because in many ways, having a contract, most contracts um, these days, particularly larger ones, are either for a lump sum or they're restricted in some way. Um, your entitlement um, to ongoing costs is restricted. And the coronavirus is a good example of this. If you didn't have a binding contract and you were undertaking works during the coronavirus pandemic, the likelihood is <clears throat> that you could walk away from the works um, and pick up other work. Or you could be claiming a quantum merit, a reasonable sum of money um, for the works that you've been doing. So you wouldn't have so many problems. Um, you wouldn't have so many risks. Um, but the flip side to that is that the risk for the contractor or subcontractor where there's no contract is that you have to prove every penny. Um, and that can be difficult. Um, keeping good records will be crucial if there's a risk that there is no contract because one of the elements of the formation of the contract have fallen down. So why are letters of intent issued? Well, they're issued um, because it creates a preliminary business framework. Um, but ultimately, the reality is about a letter of intent is that quite often they are not binding. So it's, it's fundamentally important that we try and ensure that letters of intent are binding if we're going to issue them. And they should be binding on the basis of certain specific terms. Um, and as I said earlier, it's important to make sure that you try and incorporate as many terms as you can to that early agreement, which can always be superseded by parties' agreements later. Now, there were two other cases in relation to letters of intent and contract formation, uh, which I think are relevant, and these are recent cases. Um, the first is um, MWB and Rock Advertising. Now, this is not in your slide, so you may wish to make a note, but this is a Supreme Court decision um, uh, in 2019. And um, in short, what the courts decided, this is the highest court in the land, so it binds all other courts, um, was that where a contract document states that the contract cannot be amended or varied by way of an oral agreement verbally, if the contract states that, then it doesn't matter what happens or what the parties think they may have agreed verbally. Unfortunately, it will have no effect. Um, and that was, up until that decision, a very controversial um, concept because what it does is it weighs up what the parties have agreed versus what the parties' freedom of contract is known as, their right, if you like, to undo what had already been agreed. But that case um, really made it very clear that the English courts are not going to be so generous in terms of opening up or varying existing binding agreements unless the parties follow the process that they'd agreed would apply. So if you think about that in the context of variations, of instructions, it actually has far-reaching consequences because clearly if there are provisions in a contract that set down a very specific procedure, then that procedure has to be followed. Otherwise, whatever happens um, between the parties is likely to be irrelevant um, and won't affect their entitlement. So that's a very, very important case. Um, and the other case um, that I picked up on um, very recently, again, it's not in the slides because it's a 2020 decision, uh, is, is the case of Forum Services and OOS International. Um, and in that case, there was a letter of intent issued and the parties were looking to enter into a joint venture. Um, and the joint venture never happened. Um, and there was a claim in relation to what was argued to be a binding contractual agreement and what damages would flow. And in the alternative, there was a claim for a reasonable sum of money uh, for the work that had been done by the consultancy firm Forum Services. The long and short of it, uh, this was a, an oil and gas project <clears throat> and a, a, a potential project um, between the parties. A and ultimately, the courts decided that because there was no clear contractual agreement between the parties, 
even based upon the letter of intent, because there was no um, intention to be bound, there was no reasonable degree of certainty, and there was no conclusion really to the parties' negotiations, they were just simply ongoing. In those circumstances, there was no entitlement to be paid anything by the consultant, um, even though the project ultimately did not go ahead after a fair amount of investment by the consultancy firm. So another very stark reminder um, that where you have no contract, there is a risk um, that you get no payment whatsoever. If we look at what Lord Clark said in RTS Flexible Systems, he said the different decisions in the courts and below and the arguments in this court demonstrate the perils of beginning work without agreeing the precise basis on which you're doing. In other words, the moral is you must agree before you start work. And I can't emphasize that enough. Um, in almost every case where there's a dispute, the first thing to establish is what are the contract terms. And you'd be very surprised, I'm sure, <clears throat> by the number of cases that are put to me where I'm saying, I don't think this is the contractual arrangement. I think these terms apply, not those terms. I think you've been caught out with the last shot. Perhaps a party's issued an acknowledgement of an order and you haven't quite uh, caught the, um, uh, the significance of that document. And that can change everything because an entitlement under a contract will um, always de uh, depend upon the terms that have been incorporated into that agreement. So wise words from Lord Clark there, which must be heeded. Um, now, what if work is undertaken under a letter of intent without the contract being entered into? What is the basis of payment? So in this um, Robertson um, Group case, um, this is a Scottish case, um, and it relates to the principle that um, you should be entitled to a quantum merit, a reasonable sum of money, um, if someone's had the benefit of your work. Um, in other words, um, in a different area of law called tort, a party can't have unjust um, benefit or unjust enrichment as a result of work that you've undertaken. Um, but in this case, uh, it was decided that there was no contract. Um, but what the courts did decide was that actually, whilst the contract um, fell away, there was a separate agreement, um, which said that if the contract was never finalized, then there would be an entitlement to reasonable direct costs. Um, and the courts went further in this case, interestingly, to say that overhead and profit lost as a result of the contract never being finally agreed is recoverable. In other words, under Scottish law, um, a direct or reasonably direct loss, a direct loss, would include loss of profit, overhead and profit on a project. Now, word of caution, of course, this is a Scottish case, so whilst it would be persuasive in England, um, it may not be followed necessarily because it's not binding upon the English courts. But nonetheless, a very interesting decision um, that clearly sets out um, possibilities for parties agreeing that if a contract doesn't come off, they'd be entitled to the losses. Um, now, of course, conversely, if there is a contract in place and one of the parties breaches that contract on a fundamental level, um, it would be a repudiatory breach. The contract would come to an end and then there would be an entitlement to damages in the same way. Um, but you need to have a binding contract in the first place. And you also need to be able to prove uh, such a serious breach occurred. Um, and by serious, I mean going to the heart of the contract. Um, so that would normally relate to things like not um, continuing with the work or leaving site without uh, any explanation, which could have happened, for example, during the coronavirus, if parties simply don't have the resources, they haven't given the contractual notices that they should have under the contract. If somebody's walked away from works, the reality is that will represent a repudiation, um, which would then give the other party, the innocent party, the option to accept that breach and thereby bring the contract to an end and bring a claim. So those circumstances are, over, I think, very relevant at the moment because I hear lots of stories about that happening. 
and parties simply disappearing. Um, and we'll come on to the coronavirus situation um, in a bit more detail um, later. So really, um, the starting point to decide which procurement process you're going to follow um, is about strategy. It's about project strategy. Um, and it's to be clear about how the design and construction responsibilities are to be divided. So the division of responsibility should be clear from the outset between the designer or the consultant, the contractor uh, and or, or any uh, agents that act on behalf of the client. Um, the next point to make is that that's all well and good in theory, but you must make sure that your contract documents follow the project strategy. So what is required of professional consultants has to be set out, um, obviously in their professional appointment agreement, but also should be reflected in the building contract, it should be clear in the building contract um, who is doing what. So that division of responsibility um, is, is a fundamental point and it's something um, which comes up time and time again where there is a problem um, and working out who's responsible can often be more difficult than it should be because the contract documents have not been put together properly. So it's important to get advice on those things right from the outset and, and keep refining them, keep updating them. Um, <coughs> and particularly in, in today's current climate and ahead, we face even more uncertain terms in relation to pandemics and lockdowns. Um, so your contracts really need to reflect um, those risks and also your procurement process need to reflect those risks. In terms of the JCT contract, um, the way that they uh, divide up the responsibilities um, in relation to design is that you will either have um, the standard building contract, the intermediate form or the minor works, uh, each of which have the option for a design portion. So parts of the work may be designed by the contractor and built by the contractor. But none of those forms are designed to be used as full design and build contracts. Alternatively, of course, the JCT does provide for a design and build contract. But with smaller projects, uh, more straightforward projects, um, it's not so important to have so many documents um, and so much prescription. Um, it's often just clearer that you'll have a design from an architect that's built by a contractor and has to comply with that. So the key document um, in the JCT sense uh, is the employer's requirements. The employer's requirements will set down the concept for the design, if it's um, at one end of the scale, which then needs to be developed by the contractor. Or if it's at the other end of the scale, it may be that there's a complete design already existing. Uh, and if that's the case, then effectively it's what's known as design and dump. Um, where the full design goes into the employer's requirements and the contractor must comply with everything therein. Um, the other thing to mention is that a client under a, a JCT contract um, can appoint um, a contract administrator, and they should do that. Um, it's fundamentally important for the proper operation of the contract, um, unless there is a design and build contract. And under the design and build, you have a slightly different role in relation to the employer's agent who are effectively acting on behalf of the employer. Um, and the other role, which is always useful, is the quantity surveyor. Quantity surveyors um, can be stated in the JCT forms, um, but even if they're not, I do highly recommend that quantity surveyors are involved from an early stage of the project. The reason being is that almost all projects will um, face a certain level of change or variation. And the best way um, to amicably value and agree the uh, impact of those changes uh, is by good quantity surveying having been done at an early stage. So that those things um, and the nature of work can be taken into account 
and then um, uh, the values being applied appropriately. That, that's the best way to avoid disputes in relation to those aspects of the work. So with the JCT conditions of contract, um, are the standard conditions appropriate for your project or is there any amendment necessary? Uh, or are there, for example, special insurances required? Um, and the insurance market at the moment is particularly tight. And so amendments in relation to the nature and level of insurance is important to review in terms of the overall risk of a project. But in terms of the conditions, um, the JCT contracts are designed and drafted in a way that's supposed to be even handed in terms of risk. Um, having said that, there are provisions within the contracts um, that, in my view, do require some improvement. And not just improvement, but also amendment to reflect um, the risks on the project, the risks of the contractors and subcontractors working on the project, and the risks generally um, that we face today in light of the pandemic. So those amendments should be made at the earliest possible stage. Um, but it's important to get those done by a professional, by um, a specialist advisor, such as uh, our firm, because if they're not, if a party is um, taking to documents using previous drafts, previous documents, um, or, or general experience, it can be a dangerous thing, um, simply because making a change in one part of the contract may affect obligations under other parts, which may not seem obvious at the time. So it's very important to make sure that you make changes consistently across the board. But I do highly recommend considering making those changes, particularly in today's climate. In terms of which form to use uh, under the JCT, well, as I mentioned, the first decision is whether you've got a design obligation, but in terms of the value or complexity of the project as to whether or not you're going to use the standard form, uh, the intermediate or the minor works, I would recommend reading the JCT guidance notes on this. Um, very broadly speaking, um, it has been, in my experience, uh, the case that if a project is over a million pounds, let's say, then um, one should probably not be looking at anything less than the standard building contract. Um, whereas, um, you know, between perhaps 500 and a million, you're looking at the intermediate form, and then below 500,000, um, you, you should be looking at the minor works contract, and below that you've got homeowner contracts um, as well, which are even more basic. Um, but they're general guides, uh, and it very much depends on the complexity. The more complex the project, um, the more complex, essentially, the terms that you need, the more detailed terms that are required. In terms of the structure of the forms, um, this should be stuff that's familiar to you, but if it's not, then we'll run through this. Um, we have the Articles of Agreement, um, which is where um, the basic information <coughs> um, that's relevant to the project is recorded. You then have the recitals, which sets that down in a bit more detail, but then goes into the obligations of the parties. The articles themselves, um, then you've got contract particulars, the conditions and the schedules. So in the articles, um, you'll have the names of the parties and registered offices. In the recitals, you'll have descriptions of the work, um, contract bills, contract drawings, and any schedules. In the sixth recital of division of the work into sections, if there are sections, um, and sections will dictate different separate completion dates in the contract. Um, and it's worth remembering that if you're going to have sections, you need to be prepared to operate extension of time provisions and liquidated damages provisions uh, in relation to each of those sections. Seventh, uh, framework agreements. Well, th this is an optional provision, of course. Um, and framework agreements, um, I think, will become more prevalent in, in the market uh, ahead. And the reason I say that is because I think that framework agreements provide a good deal of flexibility for clients. 
clients can have a framework agreement with a number of different um, suppliers. <clears throat> what, what happens is the terms are effectively agreed up front. And then um, there's normally a time period over which the framework applies. And then within that window of the framework, um, a client can call off um, certain aspects or packages of the work um, quite easily and quickly. Um, and so having the flexibility of a number of suppliers, particularly in today's market, where there's so much uncertainty surrounding uh, the viability of the supplier companies, the supply chain itself, and even locations geographically, um, it's important to have that flexibility for an employer. So that's the seventh recital. Eighth, you can have supplemental provisions where you might, for example, introduce some kind of protocol for pandemic management, um, uh, the um, public health regulations <clears throat> um, for social distancing and, and all of these types of provisions could now be incorporated into contracts going forward. Um, and obviously in the event of another lockdown, um, set out provisions that may apply. And then between the 9th and the 12th, you'll have the design provisions. So the contractor design portion. Um, and in there, you'll have the employer's requirements, the contractor's proposals. Um, the employer's requirements set down what the employer um, wants to achieve. And the contractor's proposal should set down how the contractor is going to achieve those proposals. But obviously, if you don't have a design obligation, then those provisions would not be used. In terms of the articles, um, you start with the obligations of the contractor. Um, you then deal with the contract sum, which in the JCT forms, um, unless you have a bill of quantities and you're looking at remeasurement style contracts, um, they are a, a lump sum. Um, and a lump sum can be varied by, by way of instructions, by way of changes, uh, either to the design or to the construction process. You then stipulate the architect or contract administrator. The contract administrator has a broad role um, to um, supervise, um, oversee the works, make sure that they're um, continuing in, in accordance with the contract, but to also certify amounts that are payable and issue notices under the contract. Quantity surveyor, I've mentioned, principal designer, principal contractor, got provisions for adjudication in the event of a dispute um, which were incorporated um, by, by way of a statutory right in any event under the Housing Grants Construction and Regeneration Act. Arbitration is an alternative to litigation um, and then you've got legal proceedings so either legal proceedings or arbitration there is a choice. Um, the JCT used to use arbitration as the default position uh, and it's now legal proceedings. I think generally because arbitration was considered um, to have no real advantages over legal proceedings. And in fact, in legal proceedings now, there is a duty to ensure that costs are proportionate, whereas that doesn't apply in arbitration. Um, you then have obviously the execution of the document. So if a document is signed uh, underhand, uh, then um, the limitation period for any um, claims for defects will be uh, six years in contract from when the works are complete or practically complete. Whereas if there's a deed, uh, it will give you a period of 12 years. Um, but there are, there are exceptions in terms of latent defects, uh, where there's a latent defect under the Latent Damage Act, you can bring a claim uh, beyond the six years and even beyond the 12 years up to 15 years, as long as you bring a claim uh, within a prompt period after discovering the damage. Uh, but there are limitations in relation to those claims um, in respect of negligence actions only, as opposed to, let's say, a workmanship issue, which is probably not covered. So the execution of the form is important in relation to protection, insurance, um, and indemnity. In the particulars, you've got even more detail, of course, um, in relation to each of the key features of the contract such as the completion date, the dates for possession, rates for liquidated damages, the rectification period, um, interim payments, insurance, uh, and of course, retention. 
Um, in the conditions, um, you start with the definition interpretation provisions. It's worth noting that under the JCT, in relation to notification of delays and issues, um, it talks about um, service of notices by post. Now, at the moment, that can be difficult, um, sometimes impossible. Um, and so, if that's the case, um, you need to note that if the provisions in the contract require that, unfortunately, you're bound by those provisions. Um, if you issue something by email, and the contract requires it by post, unfortunately it's gonna have no effect. Um, but the way around that is to obviously agree a protocol with your, um, the, your, your client or, or your contractor. So what, we, what should have happened by now is that the party should be saying, in light of the coronavirus or, or the pandemic, um, ultimately certain notices may not be able to be issued by post and collected, and therefore we suggest that um, electronic communications um, are deemed valid under the contract. And once you agree that, um, then it's likely to, to be considered that that would be valid. The schedules to the contracts um, provide even more opportunity um, to um, refine the uh, relationship between the parties. One of the key documents, which I always think is worth explaining, is the, contra the contractor's design submission procedure. If there is a design obligation on the contractor or subcontractor, and then this provision applies whereby designs can be submitted, they ought to be approved uh, within a certain time frame. Um, and it's important to note that the contract actually says unless or until designs are approved, there is no entitlement to be paid for that work. So that's an important point, obviously, in relation to valuing works. Um, and it also talks about variations being identified within seven days of the submission of documents under the provisions of the design submission procedure. So um, again, if you don't follow the contract process, it's unlikely that you're going to reserve your rights under the contract. So English law is very strict in terms of the provisions and following the contract. Um, and that's a good example um, where the parties simply have to follow that process, obviously, if it's incorporated. Um, then you've got uh, variation acceleration quotation procedures which are optional, um, I would suggest that they are a good thing, particularly in relation to issues that we now face with the virus in the sense that um, quotations um, for proposed costs um, open up negotiations. One of the key points uh, that I make about the coronavirus is that your contract may say one thing, um, but the realities are gonna be very different. And the best thing that the parties can do uh, if they're faced with uh, delays, disruption, loss and expense, is to sit down and talk about them on a without prejudice basis, or perhaps not sit down, but speak over video conference um, in relation to these things. Because the sooner you can work out an agreement, um, the sooner you can get your project back on track. The downside to not agreeing things is the risk of insolvency. Um, and if a party goes under, bringing in a third party at this time to take over works uh, is not only going to be problematic, but it's probably going to cause further delay, more cost, and so on. So protecting both parties, really, I think should be a priority at the moment. Third party rights, forms of bonds, um, that's something to consider. That's a separate subject altogether, and it is indeed another seminar of mine and, and of the firms in relation to security, project security. Um, but project security is going to be even more important um, in the coming uh, weeks, months, and even years, because the risk, the risk of delay, the risk of um, insolvency, and the risk of breakdowns in the chain of supply are higher than ever. Um, and so to protect against those things, um, you're going to have to look at options for security. Fluctuation options are another possibility, and I think that it would probably be reasonable um, in newer contracts to look at potentially using fluctuation provisions to cover changes, short-term changes in the cost of things, but it depends on how much risk contractors are prepared to take. Um, and historically, they've been prepared to take um, a lot, but I think in these current circumstances, they will be more risk averse, understandably. 
Um, and then supplemental provisions, again, I suspect we will see the new regulations uh, in relation to public health um, and the government regulations in relation to social distancing and safe working now incorporated. Minor but potentially important clauses, notices and communications I've mentioned. So clause 1.7 is something you should be looking to agree now with the other parties. Where the standard building contract 16 with quantities applies, um, it requires tenderers to use the same quantities um, and the contract bills have been prepared in accordance with the standard method of measurement. So accuracy is important. As I said earlier, you're going to be bound by the terms or prices that you submit unless it's a very clear unilateral mistake. Um, and the contract sets down how errors uh, in the descriptions um, are to be corrected under certain forms of the contract, i.e. this one under the JCT. Um, so there are provisions in there for adjustments to be made, but only in relation to certain forms, not all of the JCT forms. But in this case, uh, with Quantities 2016, does talk about um, the statutory requirements, which would include the Coronavirus Act uh, and the, the new regulations, um, and such error or omissions to be treated as a variation. So that may be an avenue for parties to look uh, to make claims in relation to changes that are required under the bills. Uh, the contract produces the, the contractor produces a price document. The total of the pricing equals the contract sum. As I mentioned earlier, using that pricing document through a quantity surveyor during the project is going to be the best way um, to ensure that changes are valued uh, consistently and to avoid disputes ultimately. In terms of the programme, obviously the key thing at the moment is trying to deal with delay. Um, and delay at the moment, because it's ongoing in many ways, um, is very, very difficult to forecast. So my suggestion is that you are effectively making reasonable forecasts um, on a regular basis to keep the parties updated. Um, but as a contractor, what you don't want to be showing is that you're behind on certain activities um, that ultimately could come back to bite you later. Um, but clearly, at this stage, there is a delay period in relation to um, a lockdown and the effect that that has had on certain projects, but not all. Um, and therefore, um, revising the program regularly uh, is an important process going forward. And obviously, the assessment of that extension of time falls back on the contract administrator or architect. Um, and so it's important for them to engage in that assessment process as well. JCT uh, provides an information release schedule that can be useful for a contractor to know when information is going to be provided. Uh, for an employer, if you've got too much information in there, then ultimately you can end up in a situation where you have too many obligations to meet within a certain time frame. Um, with a contractor's design portion, as I mentioned earlier, um, it's only in certain forms of the contract and it's a choice that you make as to whether or not uh, the contractor will have those obligations. In relation to um, how at common law, uh, that, that is the law that's created by way of judgments in this country, um, deals with interpreting a contract, essentially the rule is that you look at the contract as a whole. But it's important to note that the best drafted contracts, and this doesn't include the JCT uh, in its standard form, will have an order of priority of documents. And that's one of the key things I always recommend um, is amended in the JCT. So you have a clear priority of documents if there's inconsistency with documents um, in the contract, because that is the most common thing. Differences and, dis and um, disparities between contract documents um, is, is a big issue and it's a common issue. Generally speaking, the rules are if there's errors or discrepancies or differences um, that um, ultimately something handwritten um, is overridden by something typewritten uh, and then clearly uh, something printed. So ultimately you start with your standard terms and conditions. If you then type something on top, that would take priority over the printed form. And if there's a handwritten note, um, before contract formation, then that's likely to take priority. 
Um, and that's because the parties have specifically negotiated that particular provision. But if you then incorporate a priority of documents um, list, and that dictates which documents take priority, then that itself will take priority because it will be, uh, if it's drafted properly, will be within the conditions of the contract. So the common problems in, the, in all of these forms of contract are errors, inadequacies within the contract bills and the design documents, in and between the documents generally, um, and in and between the documents relating to the contractor's design portion. So those things can be mitigated from the outset um, by careful drafting of the contract amendments. Quite often you'll have two versions of a drawing or the wrong version is signed. The contract drawing list doesn't correspond with the drawing signed. Um, a failure to complete contract documents and a failure to complete the formality. So all of these things are common features of problems that are created um, with these forms, but they can all be avoided. They can be avoided by obviously carefully um, checking the contract documents, getting them all signed in the correct versions, and then having provisions in the contract that deal with those, the resolution of those discrepancies um, in, in the order uh, that the parties agree from the outset. So in conclusion, um, there are um, four ways primarily um, to approach procurement. Um, in my view, in these circumstances that we face, the key things to consider when looking at your project strategy are first of all going to be the risk profile uh, of the suppliers that you're looking to engage. Um, and indeed, when you're looking at risk, you must consider the geography um, and whether or not they're in high risk areas, for example, um, in relation to coronavirus. So Asian based companies or companies that get supplies from certain areas in Asia or even in Europe as well uh, and America. You've got to think carefully about how um, those firms are going to hold up if you're entering into agreements with them. Um, and the corollary to that is to make sure that your contractual arrangements or framework agreements might be a better idea to allow one for you to terminate those agreements very quickly if it's clear that there is a breakdown or, or a new lockdown in relation um, to the pandemic that allows you the flexibility without being in breach of contract to bring in replacements and then have replacements lined up have terms in place that can be utilized and and give yourself the flexibility to be able to engage others without fear of being um, in breach of contract. Um, the next thing, of course, is PPE and health and safety, um, and your provisions in your contract must uh, uh, comply with the new regulations and um, uh, getting your contract documents up to date with those through supplementary provisions is fundamental. Um, plan for the worst case. Um, amending contracts at the moment, I'm, I'm involved in a number of projects where um, the terms are changing. Um, and they're being renegotiated, uh, either on a without prejudice basis or ahead of work starting. Um, but plan for the worst case and deal up front with the consequences. Who's going to pay for the online, uh, the ongoing cost? Who's going to pay for remobilization? Who's going to pay for extra PPE? Um, how are we going to deal with the disruption that is caused and the delay that is caused by working uh, with social distancing? And all of these factors. Um, need to really be expressly dealt with in contracts because that's the only way you're going to avoid disputes. Otherwise, we're going to have years and years of, of litig litigation over these matters, which could be avoided. Um, and finally, just make sure, obviously, you deal with the requirements for working from home. Um, and that includes, remember, um, the issuing of electronic documents. So not only signing the contracts, issuing notices, dealing with certificates, dealing with valuations, and then as a contractor or subcontractor, keeping your records electronically uh, in relation to the progress of the works uh, and um, the issues that you face on and off site. So thank you very much for listening. Um, I'm now going to open up to questions, uh, which I believe will come through Julie. Julie, over to you. Okay, thank you, Roland. Um, and just to note, we had a couple of questions. Uh, Roland's 
mentioned a couple of cases that weren't in the um, seminar notes, as these are fairly recent ones. Uh, we will be sending details of these around. We'll be sending your CPD certificates out. So rest assured, you do get those as they are, are of extreme interest. Okay, first question. Is the contractor responsible for checking compliance with statutory requirements, such as building regs or planning conditions, etc., of ERs in JCT standard building contract procurement? If in this case, the project's been designed to a REBA stage four. Yes, so the, the short answer is yes. Um, there is a requirement uh, in the JCT to comply with statutory requirements. Now, the issue is that you've priced the work based upon what the requirements were at the time you sign or agree the contract. Um, but there are provisions in the contract that allow you, um, if there, is, there are changes to the um, statutory requirements post the base date, to claim those as a change or variation. So the short answer is you must comply with the regs, whatever they are. If there are changes to the regs after you've signed the contract, then uh, you, you may well have a claim to make uh, uh, for, for a change or a variation under the contract. Okay, next one. If a figure has been missed from the final contract sum, say by error in a calculation, and neither party are aware, would the contractor be stuck with it or would the client have to pay the extra? If neither party were aware of it, then the contractor would be stuck with it, is the short answer, because the risk lies with the contractor ultimately um, by preparing their contract sum. Um, it's only in the case that I mentioned um, whereby the court will give um, more credit or, or, or more be more flexible in situations where it was obvious that a mistake had been made. So. It's really a question of whether it's obvious and whether they're aware or ought to have been aware. Um, and what the court said in that case is that any reasonably honest company director looking at that contract um, bill, in that case, there, there were two aspects of the work. Um, you had the supply of materials and cladding and the bill simply just didn't have a figure for cladding, uh, even though it was clear that they were going to provide the cladding. So the court said, well, looking at that, it's obvious. It's obvious that there, there should have been a price there and it wasn't. But if it's not so obvious, I'm afraid I think the contractor would be stuck with it. Okay. Next one is how far up the supply chain or chain of command should a subcontractor go to conduct due diligence checks, e.g. source of funds, to comply with statutory requirements? Um, well, it, I mean, it depends which statutory requirements um, that, that you're referring to. Um, but in, in general terms, um, I think it's a question of reasonableness. Um, so, you know, in terms of source of funds, um, it's common sense really that has to be applied. Um, so you, you would look at an organization, if you can see from their accounts um, that they are generating a certain um, turnover or profit, um, or they have a banking facility that may allow them um, X amount of lending. If there's a reasonable explanation um, for the situation that's being presented, then I don't think anyone's going to criticise you um, <clears throat> for relying upon that. Um, but obviously, if you, if you don't do sufficient due diligence or on a common sense basis, um, something doesn't uh, smell right, then ultimately, I think you should be raising red flags and asking for more information. Okay. Um Next one is, can some of these unknowns be covered by insurance specifically or generically, or sorry, generally identify potential unknowns, pandemics and other act of God issues? Yes, yeah, so um, insurance um, at the moment is obviously a hot topic and it's something that is developing day to day because um, I, I believe, as I understand it, there's only one um, big insurer who has agreed to pay out certain monies on account in relation to business disruption as a result of coronavirus. Um, what the insurers are saying is that um, unless you've got very specific pandemic cover, you're not covered. <clears throat> but I, I personally think that they will um, ultimately end up having to pay out on some of these policies 
um, because you know that's what the insurance is for in many ways it is is the unforeseen events um, that occur on a project that's outside of the control of the parties um, and, and acts of God is, is very much something that ought to be covered um, and so I think um, the smart way to do it is to, if you can, sit on your hands until somebody else pays for the litigation to get an answer to that question um, uh, and, and then see if you can follow suit. But ultimately, what you should be doing in the meantime is making your claims, um, maintaining your position, send, uh, keeping your records, very good detailed records of what's happening, um, and then keep all that back and keep submitting it and maintaining your position. That, that's all you can do in the meantime, and I suspect we'll get guidance in due course. Okay, um, the next question is, if there are elements of the tender that are not referenced in the trade contract, i.e. day work rates, shall the tender rates apply or is there opportunity to negotiate the rate? Well, there, there's always a, an opportunity, even after the contract is signed, to negotiate rates. Um, so that, that's the, the short answer. Um, if, if there are no day work rates specified in the contract, but the contract refers to um, the, um, uh, the, the option of having day work rates apply, then, it, then it's then open to the parties to then put forward reasonable day work rates. But the way that the JCT works is that you need agreement to apply day work rates anyway. So I suspect the way it would work is if you want day work rates to apply, you would invite the agreement of the other party and put forward rates and then seek to negotiate and agree those rates. And then you then you can apply them under the contract. Okay, uh, another one here. Have you seen or heard of a contract signed in escrow clause or escrow clause? If so, what's your view? Um, not, not heard of a contract signed in escrow. Um, escrow agreements tend to just be in relation to the sort of holding of funds um, subject to a condition being satisfied or a party giving instruction. Um, but if you're talking about a delay in contract being awarded, I don't see any point in having an escrow provision um, in relation to the exercise of the contract. Okay. Um, a couple more questions. You've provoked quite a lot of response here this morning. Um, are there two offer acceptance situations in the event of tendering? One at the time of invitation to tender by employer for potential tenderers, and two at the time the employer accepts the successful bidder's offer? The short answer is no. Um, the invitation to tender is known as an invitation to treat. Um, there's a, there's a great case involving um, Boots Pharmaceutical Company um, many, many years ago um, where before shops um, advertised prices on items. Um, and so you'd walk into a shop, there'd be a load of things on the shelf, you'd pick something up and then you'd go to the counter. Um, and there was a question over whether or not it was legal for Boots to actually sell things um, over the counter that required a pharmacist to be present. Um, and there was a question whether you could actually buy something um, and when the contract was created. Um, and the courts decided that if you have a price advertised for something, it's as much like an invitation to treat. Um, it's not an offer. The offer occurs when you walk to the counter in the case of Boots uh, and you hand over the item and say, I'd like to buy this. They will then tell you the price which is the offer, and then you decide whether to accept it or not by handing over your money. And so that's the moment. And so in the example given, the invitation to tender uh, is not an offer at all. The offer only occurs when uh, a, a price is put forward um, or an offer of services is made. And that's when the contract is formed. So there's only one um, exchange becomes binding. Okay. Um if no date is stated in the subcontract date of part one for the subcontractor starting date, a notice period is instead stated. What, is the, what are the implications of the subcontractor commencing works before a notice of starting date is issued? Um, that's a good question. Um, the, the answer is that if there is 
a duration for the work stated in the contract, the subcontract, and there is a provision for notice to commence, then if the notice to commence is given, the duration uh, will kick in and um, that would be the contract period. But if those provisions are there and there's no notice to commence given, then arguably what happens, and the subcontractor in this case starts early, arguably what happens is that time is rendered at large. Um, there can't be a contractual uh, duration in those circumstances because um, the provisions in the contract have not been followed. And of course the uh, consequences of that are that the contractor then has an implied obligation uh, under section 14 of the Supply of Goods and Services Act to complete within a reasonable time um, they cannot be liable for liquidated damages, um, but they could be liable for general damages uh, if, if they fail to complete within that reasonable period, which would need to be established by way of a programme or evidence. Okay. Um, you spoke earlier about entering into contracts. If a con contractor signs and returns to the employer full contract documents but haven't received back their sign set, are they in contract? and the previous LOI superseded. Contract documents in this particular scenario were issued following the capped LOI value being reached. Okay, so I think that what would happen is that if, if there are key documents that have been signed and returned, um, then it's likely that there's a contract on that basis. Um, the fact that certain documents haven't been returned I don't think is fatal. The question would be whether or not those other documents um, are effectively agreed um, by conduct, um, and they probably are, so long as um, in the response where the four documents are signed, it doesn't say we're prepared to agree to just these four documents, for example. But if it's just a case of, yes, we're happy with the contract, here are the signed documents, and they happen to not sign some of them, I don't think that's relevant. I think ultimately by conduct or by signature, it seems to me that all of those documents would have been incorporated into the agreement. But that's one of those cases. And the, the, see, all of these cases are very fact sensitive. And in, in order to give a proper clear answer, um, obviously you have to look at all the documents and consider them. Okay. Um... Someone here is saying that they have used PCSA agreements instead of an LOI to help the, con the contractor get paid some monies for design fees, etc., before entering into the main JCT D and B. Is there a benefit doing this, being that PCSAs are normally used for two-stage tenders? Um, yes, there is a benefit, um, and uh, I would um, encourage using uh, pre-construction uh, agreements because as I said earlier, it avoids the uncertainty of letters of intent um, and the problems that can arise uh, over questions as to whether or not they apply, they don't apply, they're superseded, they're not superseded. Um, this is where things go wrong. So yes, uh, it doesn't matter that it's not a two-stage tender. Get yourself into a pre-construction agreement is a good idea. Have clear terms incorporated. And then if you can subsequently agree a full contract, make sure that that says that it supersedes the pre-construction or, or if it's a separate agreement, you know, however you want to structure it, but just make sure you deal with the previous agreement in the subsequent agreement, because often that can be left out and that leaves things confusing. Parties will say, well, what about the money I paid under the letter of intent or the work that I've already done earlier? There needs to be a clear line of, uh, of separation or the second document will say it, it supersedes and incorporates all of the obligations under the previous contract. Okay, uh, just a couple more. How would you add in project bank accounts as an option? Um, well, the answer is by way of an amendment. Um, and, um, you know, you would specify in there how the project bank account is to be used um, and who is in control of that. Often you'll have an agent um, and there'd need to be an agreement, a separate agreement with that agent, um, much like the escrow situation where they have authority only in certain circumstances to release money. Um, and I've drafted uh, many of those. A number of them relate to um, payments that are certified. So once you get a certificate for payment, uh, 
um, it goes to the agent, the agent then releases the money um, uh, and that's how it's dealt with. Okay, if a client issues a PO to a contractor but the contract itself has not been executed, does issuing the PO give rise to an agreement and therefore is the contractor entitled for works carried out, even if the client has told the contractor not to work until the contract is signed? Um, that's another very fact sensitive situation. Um, but if you go back to sort of the, the Chichester case that I referred to, um, and the fact that there was a PO issued and then an acknowledgement and the acknowledgement became the basis of the contract. Um, and also, um, the, the case of, uh, Brogdon and Metro as well as an old case that's in, in the slides confirms that, um, in that case, uh, there was about it, it was to do with the supply of coal and terms were submitted uh, in relation to the supply of this coal um, and there was never a formal response to them but they carried on supplying the coal and the courts decided that by conduct you've um, accepted those terms so the only little wrinkle in all of that um, is is the fact that in this case the client is saying don't do any work until you've signed a contract um, which could be seen to be analogous to rock advertising where it says there'll be no amendment um, unless it's in writing. But I think they're different. I think that um, you're probably more uh, in the situation of the RTS uh, Mulcari case that I mentioned, uh, which is where, although it said subject to contract, in this case it said subject, you know, don't do anything with subject to signing the agreement, um, don't do any work. But then if an employer then allows you to do work and presumably pays you for some of that work, I think you've got a good argument to say that that, that requirement falls away. Um, and therefore, uh, you're probably left in a position where the purchase order is binding. Okay. A couple of quick ones here left. Um, in the event of time at large, are prevailing conditions of contract valid or not? Uh, sorry, Julia, I missed, missed the second part of that. In the event of time at large, are prevailing conditions of contract valid or not? Uh, prevailing terms. Um, so uh, if by prevailing you mean the time provisions, the answer is no. But if by prevailing you mean everything else in the contract, then the answer is yes. Um, you know, all of the other obligations in relation to the, the scope of the works and uh, the payment provisions, everything carries on uh, as agreed. But the only provisions that won't, as I mentioned, would be the, the, the time provisions themselves. There'd be no requirement for extensions of time. If there's time at large, you simply don't have them. Um, so loss and expense would be... Um, assessed on a different basis. Um, and then finally, the um, practical completion date could still be determined, but the effect on the um, liquidated damages, that would obviously fall away as well because liquidated damages can only apply to a contractual date. Uh, and when time is rendered at large, you no longer have a contractual date. Okay, and the last one is under a letter of intent, how can variations and instructions be dealt with? Well, that depends on what the letter of intent says, and it also depends on whether it's binding. Um, if a letter of intent is not binding, so it says subject to contract, terms to be agreed, uh, and they're simply never agreed, then if there's no contract, it means that there are no uh, provisions for changes or variations. Um, so you simply can't have them. If there are so-called changes and variations, um, if there's no contract, then those changes and variations would be separate contracts. They'd be new contracts um, because there's simply no right um, to, to make any changes because you can't change something that doesn't exist. Um, if, the if the letter of intent is binding, so it's got all the essential terms, um, you know, uh, scope, uh, period for the works, terms, uh, and price. If everything's in there, then the question is, well, do the terms and conditions include any provisions that deal with changes or variations? 
Um, and if they do, then obviously you follow those procedures. If the terms do not include or provide for variations or changes, then the question becomes, do the parties subsequently make separate agreements which vary the original agreement? So it becomes very uh, fact sensitive as to whether or not you can prove that certain changes subsequent to the letter of intent um, take effect. Um, so it's a very fact sensitive situation that. Okay, well, that, that's the end of the questions for today, Ryland. And as we've previously said, you know, if anyone's got any specific queries uh, with some of these fact sensitive things, they can contact you directly via your, your uh, email address, rylandash at silverllp.com is there on the slide. Um, thank you to everyone for turning up. Thank you, Ryland, for sharing your, your wisdom with us. Uh, we hope to see you all soon, and this recording will be available from tomorrow. So those of you who want to uh, get some more facts in your head can watch it all over again. Um, otherwise, we will see you, uh, some of you later, for five o'clock. Uh, others, we will see you hopefully soon. Take care, everyone, and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks, Ryland. Thank you, Julie. Thank you, everybody. And please do get in touch.